to SER acknowledges the custodians of the Gadigal and Darug lands from which we broadcast. You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are here discussing a new novel from 2020, Alex Pavese's Eight Detectives, otherwise known as The Eighth Detective, but in Australia it was sold here as Eight Detectives, which is, is going to perpetually confuse me because I know it by both <laughs> titles, and I'm sure I'll switch up between the two of them, but Herds, we're covering chapters one to five, you're in the hot seat. At least it's not like a, an egregious difference between the two titles, yeah, it's yeah. not too difficult to like... You know, you could kind of mishear one and segue into the other. I mean, there there are plenty of books we've covered on the show that have had multiple titles, but never one that I could think of that's been so similar, but so, like, difficult to bridge for me. I don't know what's going yeah. on. But either way. Look, I, I think it's cool. Yeah, I'm in the hot seat, which is great. I'm really enjoying trying to puzzle out this one. Obviously, we'll get into the solving in the mystery section, but I do want to say I love that this murder mystery is like, we're just going through yeah. a bunch of murder mystery stories and reading them. And we're trying to like put the pieces together. What's the big deal here? What's the broader picture? And that's kind of the vibe we're going with. And that these nice punchy stories. It's yeah. really cool. So the, the setup here is that uh, Julie Hart is sitting down for an interview with Grant McAllister, who is the author of detective stories, professor of mathematics, and has been, living sequestered away in a remote island in the Mediterranean. Yes. And they're going through this collection of seven murder mysteries called The White Murders that Grant wrote when he was younger. Mm -hmm. And Julie's kind of there to try and figure out, you know, what the inspirations were uh, behind the stories. And we as the audience effectively get to read seven short murder mystery stories. We've only had three of them today. Yeah. And there's, there's seven of them, as you know, going in, but the story is called mm -hmm. The Eighth Detective or Eight Detectives. Yeah. And thus you can infer there's a little extra to solve, and thus it takes us into the world of metafiction. Yeah, there's something going on beyond. And the way that the book is structured, I really enjoyed this. Um, it opens on, you know, one of the stories, uh, Spain, 1930. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple title fitting for a first novel. Um, they, they seem to get more complex as you go along through the stories, which I really enjoy. Um, and it only has three characters in it. It's a very seemingly straightforward affair. Um, and then we cut back, you know, movie style, we cut back to the conversation between Julia and Grant and they discuss that story. And then we read Death of the Seaside, where we learn about Dr. Winston Brown and, and the murder at the seaside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we cut back and we have the, uh, Julia Grant talk about that story. And we, we go back and forth like this presumably until somebody pulls a gun on somebody. <laughs> I, I assume that that's, or something explodes. Um, maybe the tea is explosive. I don't know. This is one of these sorts of books I have a lot of faith in because it has a middling review score. Ah, and that's a shame. I want to, I want to credit, I want to credit Solari Gantel for this one because I remember she came up and was speaking with me at the bad Sydney crime writers festival. And was saying that she was really chuffed that both of her two favorite books of her own had sort of these middle reviews because they set out a complex challenge that a lot of people feel overwhelmed by. And that's something that, you know, isn't going to be for everyone, but if it is for you and you spot a book like this, you know you're in for a great time. Can, can, can I tell you, I'm I'm looking now at a review. I'm being very careful here because I, look, I don't like to read reviews, especially books that I'm trying to solve. Yes. But this person gives the book four stars and says that they recommend it for its novelty, which is a very specific thing to recommend a book on. And they call them horror crime stories, which is probably why I'm enjoying them so much because I wasn't expecting there to be a little creepiness to the events in this story, but it, it seeps in. Yeah, it, right? it's, it's the exact sort of like divisive storytelling that you know is doing something interesting. Yeah. And one of the things that's best about that, you were mentioning that Spain 1930 has three characters, a very simple setup before things get more complex. And that's because Alex Pavesi is a mathematics PhD. Yes. And you know he's going to get into something complicated. So this opening story is basically your foothold to say, here's how the game is going to work, and then we will ramp up the difficulty. And 
I thought that this application of it, where it goes in, points out the inconsistencies in the story, which is something I'm going to challenge you to do later yeah. in the show, Herds. I'm so ready for that. It's going to be great. And then break down how that applies to this meta narrative of Grant McAllister. Why do you not remember this very specific choice you made in the White Murders mm. all this time ago? Yeah, you you know what the questions are. You know that it's about inconsistencies. It is a very good establishing of fundamentals and showing you're working mathematics and all uh, before we get into the depths of the game. And I, as someone who reads a lot of online reviews of books while we try and pick pick things for this show saw the reviews for eight detectives and thought to myself yes this is it let's go yeah i, I want to touch on that that sort of horror subgenre of crime fiction that we're, that we're looking at here that was a bit of a mouthful but like one of the things that uh occurs in that conversation where you know julie is pointing out the inconsistencies and talking about the inspiration for the book on the white murders and whether or not the original white murder that occurred in real life has any influence I'm, on I'm sure it's these just stories, a which it definitely doesn't. As as Grant assures her, it has nothing to do with these stories. But she also starts commenting, and this is you know something I noticed obviously that his detectives seem to be very unkind. Yes. You know, in the first story, there are two characters suspecting each other. So they are both in a way, the detective and they're supposed to have been lovers in the past. They have a shared history. They were coming here to meet with their friend, bunny, and they've turned on each other at the first sign of violence. Yes. They're like you are the killer. I am certain of it. Let's go to war. And in the other two stories, the detective is not very nice. They have these like, sociopathic undertones to them. They're creepy and and villainous, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, when we're walking along the seaside path in Death at the Seaside and it feels less like we're there to solve the tragic murder of a woman who's fallen from a cliff and feels more like a bloodhound just sniffing out prey. Well, in his conversation with the, the constable afterwards, which is like a classic sort of breakdown, though he doesn't do it with the suspect, which is already like... A little suspicious, but we'll get into that. He says, let me tell you, Constable, about the truth of the matter. And I, let me tell you how I did it all with just this one clue, just this one little scarf here. I solved everything and aren't I the coolest? Mm -hmm. And he does. it doesn't feel like he's doing it for the right reasons. Yes. It doesn't feel like he's looking for justice. It feels like he wants, because the, they've already solved the crime without him. Yeah. They've already figured out what's going on. He just wants to cut in and say, uh, actually, I also knew the answer to that question. Well, I just didn't say it. It's also <laughs> like, such a great way that this book establishes the importance of motivations because the book centers around this paper that Grant McAllister wrote called The Permutations of Detective Fiction, which is sort of meant to be a pastiche on your Ronald Knox, your S.S. Van Dyne, laying out the rules of detective fiction. But his rules are way more specific and sort of esoteric in that it's like, here is the mathematical number of suspects that a murder mystery must ha have. But it's like a window. It's from like one to infinite. And that's kind of useless as a concept, but it does show you that the story is focusing on the mechanics of the puzzle while just like that discussion with the constable there, ignoring the motives. Well, it's more kind of philosophical in a sense. Like it's more like he's... He's whittling the bare nub of existence down to see what he can make of it. It doesn't really seem at the moment, at least to have like a productive end. It's more just to, to prove this, you know, th that maths can fit into murder mystery just so, so that he can say that he's done it. Yeah. And, and clearly like he also would talk about motive here. Clearly he has like a disdain for, for truth finders in, in a certain way which is interesting that he's trying to like prove this, these logical truths, but he also paints the detectives in his story in such a like cruel light. It's, it's hypocritical in a way. It's also really interesting when we get down to Julia Hart showing up because she is supposedly there as like an editor who's been sent there by a publisher after they found out what had happened to the long missing Grant McAllister. Mm. But we know that Grant doesn't like truth solvers, so he doesn't like Julia being there asking questions about his work, but he's still interested in answering them. But there's also a question of like, well, why is she actually there? He answers some questions, but others he leaves open. When she says, oh, so this is the answer to your murder mystery that you just revealed in your book. He says, yes, I suppose you could understand the book that way. Like <laughs> he, he doesn't want to 
actually tell her what's going on in his novels. He's happy to talk about, you know, some aspects of his writing, but he's being very selective. It is it is really interesting how nicely that walks the line between Alex Pavesi as the author going, oh, well, I can't show my whole hand to you yet, but also using it mm. so strongly to characterize Grant. And the yeah, question is, totally. is like, why is he like that? As we get further in, going back to that point about how it really likes to obfuscate motive through mechanics. Yeah. Well, we were speaking with uh, with Ben Hobson about the the death of John Lacey and how, you know, when you read a book, especially a book that gets quite dark, that is about dark subjects, you bring a lot of yourself to the story. And I feel like we, we're learning a lot about Julia as well yeah. by the assumptions that she makes. Like she says at the end of the first book, without any hesitation, you know, she says, oh, so the, the woman did it, M Megan did it. Even though uh -huh. those two characters are equally likely to have been the killer, Julia says, yeah, like Megan, Megan did it. That's what happened, right? Well, yeah, it, it's really interesting too, because the story kind of claims through Julia that it is obvious that that is the solution, right? I don't, yeah, I don't think it is. <laughs> it doesn't frame it as her interpretation. Well, yes, it, it frames it as like, this is the, the answer that I think is true. I would like confirmation, please, to like be sure. We learn a lot about the way that she sees the world and the way that she sees Henry as like a pathetic little little man who couldn't possibly have committed this crime, you know, which I think is, is really, I think it's really cool. I think it's really strong. I guess the other thing I was curious about, Herds, is for you reading a part of this story now, how have you been finding the like volume of information between the few stories? Because one of the reasons oh my goodness. when this book first came out, I got it uh, like when it released T to be honest, because I really like the cover design. I'm sorry, I'm that kind of reader. Um, <laughs> it's, good. it's good. And it's a great cover. Really love the Australian cover for this book. I, you know, I, I gave it a read through as like a speculative thing for the show. And I'm like, oh, this is maybe like a little bit dense. Like there's there's too many characters to keep track of. I know Herds doesn't like having all of these characters. Like that's, you know, dozens of let, different let stories. Just, let me just begin by saying that I've basically thrown out all the characters in the second story. I could not tell you <laughs> what any of their names are. I, I mean, the first story is very simple. It's only three characters. In the second story, I know Laurie. I know that Alice was the person who was killed. You know, I have some notes there. But yeah, it, it is a lot. But I, I think that the way that each of the stories, like they get progressively longer and more complex, certainly helps you kind of wind up your expectations, especially if you start to look for patterns in the stories, you can kind of say, oh, well, these characters are similar. You know, like there's a victim yeah. in every story, for example. So you just remember there's a victim there and there's probably something that like ties them all together thematically. And then you kind of work outwards. Um, the role of detective, the police, where they fit in the story, that sort of thing. So, you know, I've I've definitely noticed some, some, some inconsistencies, some details Ooh. that I want to highlight in a little bit. But um, I, I guess- just trying to hone in on the important parts of the stories and what I think is going to be relevant in the past, which I'll explain what I mean by that when we get to the, the latter part of the show. Yeah. Of I, I think the thing that was a tough choice for me and one of the things like, you know, covering Benjamin Stevenson's everyone in my family has killed someone coming back to this and really thinking like, yeah, you know, okay, I think we can sort of talk about the smaller clues in the scope of this story that has a lot of characters that don't factor in because the short stories from white murders by grant McAllister inside a detectives are good they have a lot of cool detail and a lot of fun puzzles but unless you're into the bite-sized atmospheres that they make and the sort of horror atmospheres that you know i was drawing that line between how you were talking about everyone in my family has killed someone uh, and thinking like yeah maybe that is enough to kind of keep herds going through this book. Well, what is everyone in my family has killed someone, if not a series of vignettes about, you know, the different characters in the family exactly. and how they all killed someone, you yeah. know, like it's a very smart way to structure your novel just to keep them in these, these segments. And you have an idea for each individual segment and they're all kind of cohesive on their, on their own. Um, that definitely helps with kind of moving through the story at a good pace. Yeah. And, and it definitely is like a challenge as well, because if you are a reader who is very committed to character arcs there's not that many character arcs to follow here outside the murder narrative because everyone's wrapped up in their little short stories they're flat right yeah they they begin in a place and they end in a place and they didn't really have very far to go i mean the, certainly the, the the third story is the best example of this where like it's it's not that we have a character arc it's that 
are detectives revealed to be yes, yes. not the nicest guy. Like that's kind of the arc. Like it's more like the reader, you know, follows the plot and goes on their little their little journey of understanding who this character is and and as you say, what their motivation is, what they're really after. Yeah. So right? you you as the reader sort of need to trust that the meta narrative will be enough to keep you going there because whilst the short stories are good and i enjoyed them i hope so uh they they definitely do intentionally leave a bit to be desired as is kind of shown through the inconsistencies that julia and grant discuss in each sort of in-between chapter look i choose to believe that anyone who has a heart for mathematics is going to go full ham full crazy bones and i don't know i feel like i've definitely gone down a bit, <laughs> of, a, a bit of a rabbit hole trying to figure out the structure of this novel um, and I, I hope that Alex can, can meet me there. In I hope. Indeed. I guess we'll find out at the end of today's show where your initial thoughts up to herds. It's going to be great. We are discussing Alex Pavese's Eight Detectives from 2020, chapters one through five. We'll be back in just a second with more of that. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are discussing Alex Pavese's Eight Detectives, chapters one to five, also known as the eighth detective in uh, most of the rest of the world, I believe. All the cool parts of the world. Herds, you are challenged with solving this novel. It is our triple or nothing game, which means at the end of the year, if you're not in the lead, all your points go to zero. And Herds, there's a bit of a gambit on Uh where you can request five points for any one novel this year. Is Alex Pavese's The Eighth Detective going to be your book of choice? I I would love to. I'm feeling pretty pretty good about this one. But unfortunately, I made a solemn oath, and that was to hold out my Quinn quintuple points Alrighty. until the Alrighty. end of the year for the final book. And so I'm going to, I'm going to hold back. I'm going to hold back on that one. Well, three points it is hers. Three points. Hopefully we're still going to go down with your, with your a theory this week and next week, but your other point oh. on top of your two theories herds is I want you to find for me an inconsistency in the short stories or in the meta narrative. Any, any of what well, in the meta narrative. Oh no, don't say that. that the book has not pointed out to you. You can do that this week or next week. Up to you. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it this week. I've, I've I got a couple. You. I, I believe in you. Can, can I say, I had an inkling that you were going to ask about this. And so I started looking for inconsistencies. And then I noticed that there were a couple more. And I feel like I have a pretty decent idea what's going on. At least I hope I do. Uh, because if I'm wrong, then I have wasted a lot of time. Uh-huh. And I deserve to go to an asylum. Nice. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the thing. I was looking in the third story for some inconsistencies and I realized the way that they're kind of framed so far is that uh-huh. we, we set up something in usually environmental in the first part of the story. And then towards the end, when it's getting into the murder mystery clues, um, there's some, there's something that's, that doesn't make sense. There's something yeah, that. Yeah. So for example, in the first story, we see that like the sun is setting on one side of the house, but even in the shaded side of the house, there's still like a shadow from a dagger that's like backlit by the sun. Yeah, apparently the dagger is leaving a shadow, which is just great. If there's because it leads you to the question of because I need to tell you, my first impression of this story was that each of the inconsistencies was something that had been unintentionally left in, because that's the way that Grant reacts to those questions. He says, Oh, yeah, I guess I might have left that detail in for fun or on accident. And I was thinking, oh, so we're supposed to take all these inconsistencies and turn them into, you know, the real crime that happened. But I couldn't quite link those together. What, what real um, crime? I'm, what are you talking about? <laughs> the, the white murders. What? Now, that's, a, that's a book. Th- yes, it's definitely not a real murder that happened to anybody. No one's child and or wife was was killed, I'm sure. That's kind of the vibe I'm getting. I, I should say, sarcasm aside, there is story of the white murders which is a young woman who was murdered. I'm I'm going to just say I think that the the woman who was murdered was either the fiance or the daughter of Grant. I am oh. erring towards fiance. Interesting. Because I just I just feel like daughter would raise it would add too many characters. We'll, we'll get to that. So here's the thing: the, the inconsistency that I noticed as I was going through the book was uh, a, a neck. Actually, a neck. The way that the third story sort of resolves is that there are there are four people in coats which turns out to be three yeah there's a man in blue a man in black who turns out to be uh the detective who wears brown when he later visits the crime scene and his partner who is 
in gray. And it's sort of revealed at the end, you know, ah, oh, I was wearing black. And so they didn't know it was me who killed the girl. And and it's it's all about how evil the, the detective is. Which I'm very curious because that feels like a reference to another murder mystery novel that we've read on the show here. Probably. That I won't name. But I was very curious Please if don't. that was intentional because it was. Uh, yes, it was. It was nice having a bit of a throwback like that hidden in, amidst my metafiction. Yes, and the thing that I that I noticed the inconsistency was that the uh, blue man, the man in blue, who is killed at the end of the story, framed for the crime. Yeah, he uh, has a very long neck when he hangs himself. It's noted that he like. You know, he puts his tie, I think it's his tie around his neck. And obviously when I first read this, I went, oh, well, that's an example of the author, like changing the details to be more dramatic because obviously it's easy to hang yourself and more obvious if you have a long neck. What? You you think this is going towards like a horror movie situation where it's like a fake body no. or? <laughs> I don't think it's a fake body. I like think he's that- strung up a pig. Here's the thing. There are, there are more inconsistencies. Oh God, I don't even know how to, it's the scarf. It's the brown scarf, Flex. The brown scarf? What is the brown scarf not done to you, Hurts? Not only, here's the thing, not only does the description of the man at the start not line up with the man who is dead, uh-huh. but the description of the man in black does not line up with the description of the detective who was also wearing black. Uh-oh. So we actually have two men in black. Oh, no. One of which is the killer. <laughs> The man in black in the present was wearing blue in the past and is the original foreshadowed killer. And I think because it's not, (laughs) you can see why I'm, I feel crazy right now. It's not any of these other people who we've talked about. They, they cross off like every suspect of the list. Um, The only person I think who is mentioned who is not crossed off is the, the maid has like a necklace. That's like very expensive. I think that she is going out with some kind of crook some kind of pervert Uh-oh. crook, possibly, oh, geez. possibly she's got the necklace from him. Yeah. I think that, uh, it, it's entirely possible that he is killing dames and taking their jewelry and giving it to her. Yeah. Now here's, here's the thing. This, this was a long process to kind of put that theory together. I, I did want to say one of the reasons that herds is, is, is floundering so much here, failing dramatically <laughs> on, uh, on chapter number five, story number three, a detective and his evidence is that we don't we haven't read chapter six. We're only doing chapter one to five. And yeah, we, we don't have the breakdown yet between Julia and Grant. I guess one of the questions I want to ask here, once you once you finished your train of thought, is what <laughs> what do you think Grant and Julia are going to point out that is or isn't anything that you've said? The most obvious one is is the neck length. I think that you're like, wow, that guy had a long neck. Uh-huh. <laughs> I feel like that's that's got to be the clue because it's so obvious. It's like the first thing. It's like the foreshadowing of the criminal at the start. Yeah. It says that he has a non-existent neck and he has all these other details about him. And it doesn't match up with any of the other characters that are mentioned in, in the book. I also want to say, I think the, the broader structure of this is that we're using the fake solution from the story that we just read to solve the previous ones. Oh. So let me let me explain. So the lesson that we learned from this one is that the detective can tamper with evidence, yes. which means that the time that he spent, Julia points out that um, the, there's a huge time discrepancy where nothing seems to happen. This is in Death in the, at the Seaside. In, in the second yeah. story, in Death at the Seaside. It goes from like day to night. Yes, I think that that is the time where uh, Mr. Winston Brown goes and tells this story of this this woman being pushed off the cliffside to the boatman or sends him a letter or something. He's setting all of this up. He's right. he's creating evidence. So so in the same way then that the the Spain 1930 story mm-hmm. there there isn't anything to kind of unwind a story before it there, which is why that one's so much more simple. The lesson that we learned from the second story is that it could have been an accident. I I'm going to say I don't think it's a dagger, or at least I don't think that it is actually, because the words that they use are that the dagger's blade is hidden. It doesn't say that the blade is in his back. The red is wine. I think the idiot, because he was drunk and crashed his car however many years ago at Oxford, uh-huh. I think that he's gone and plastered himself, fallen down on the bed face first, and, and he's, oh, he's suffocated. Okay. So I guess the question that I was sort of <laughs> leaning towards there is yeah, that what's the, question? the solution to the inconsistency of the yeah. first story is that in a story with two detectives, one of them knows who the other has killed because there are only two people, there are only two suspects, and one knows what they've done, right? Yes. What yes. is that? Is that solving the meta narrative? Because that's the only course, like other story we yes. have so yes, far. Yes, it is. 
Um, it is a loop. Yes, 100%. That means that the lesson that we learn um, from the text itself, not from the inconsistencies, but from the text itself, the theory that he's putting forward in, the, in Spain is that when there, are, there, there can be only two suspects, that is the lowest number required. Mm -hmm. That means that in the meta narrative, we have two characters. They are both the suspects. And we're supposed to figure out which one of them so is the killer. Are you suggesting to me, Herds, that one of Julia and or Grand killed the victim of the actual white murders? I'm going to say yes. I, I also would accept that one of them will kill the other by the end of the book. I think that's also would be acceptable. It has not escaped my notice that Grant has terrible eyesight. And so he wouldn't recognize the killer, even if he had seen them previously. And he like couldn't get his story out, for example. Right. You think that one of them is there to tie up loose ends? I would say so. I would say so. You know, I'll be honest, I'm not as confident about the white murder meta narrative as I am about the individual stories. But I mean, hey, we're only we're only <laughs> three stories in. So I'm you know, I <laughs> I think it's a pretty yeah. good innings that you've put yourself forwards here. I feel pretty great about this. I hope that I have got at least here's the other narrative device right. that I'll point out to you, Herds, just to just to Please buddy do. you up before Alex Pavesi thoroughly <laughs> dismantles you next week. Oh no! Is the difference uh. between the seven stories in the White Murders and eight detectives is that eight makes a loop. It does. Yes, it's an infinite symbol. Mm -hmm. I was also going to say the other mathematical device that we're leaning on here is uh, recursion. Yeah. In a in a progressive series of, of of statements, you you build upon the one that previously came. And so if we look at it, as you say, as an eight, I can't believe I missed that like visual cue there. But yeah, if you look at it as an eight where it bends in on itself, it's a snake eating its tail. Uh -huh. We've built a recursive loop, which probably means that we are in hell now that I think about it. That seems that seems great. Well, I mean, that's the really fun <laughs> thing about the, the story goes in and it talks about how it is kind of surprising that anyone expects anything of the detective fiction genre because mm. by premise, it sets up that you will kind of circle back to the end or so the novel says for sure yeah. but it it means that sentence in a very different tone to what you're suggesting herds but i like that you've sort of reverse engineered that statement about the murder look, mystery genre i will i will have to look at that statement again and like because i have to post another theory next week yeah, how the do. heck am i gonna do how am i gonna post a theory of equal gravitas as it's all it's all simulation. It's all in hell. And we're all, we're going through the eight levels of hell uh -huh. and they're all recursive. Like, I mean, I'm listen, Hertz, maybe next week you come in and tell me that each story tells you the solution to the one after it. <laughs> I mean, you know what? If that's actually how I was supposed to read it, I'll be, I'll be very annoyed. Maybe every story has a solution to every other story. And look, I believe you're it. about believe to be it. tracing out six degrees of Fractals. separation, eight degrees of separation as the case may be. I, that sounds horrifying. Look, I'll, I'll be honest. I mostly like the idea of the of the stories like building on each other because that's when I first started to like notice the pattern. Yeah. But I I, I think that it is fair to say that all of these stories were built with a central theme in mind, mm -hmm. and so they probably have some some common elements that are building off each other. That's that's just how that's how a cohesive work of fiction works. Uh huh. I <laughs> anyway. I look, I'm really enjoying I'm, you going. I'm not as smart as I'm trying. I, I was concerned <laughs> when I posed a book with like mathematics as its core that Ben was just going to like come here and complain because it's not about train times. Yeah, the only time the only time differences that matter is like there is a gap of time missing here. Also. I don't know if this is a thing in the physical book, but there's lots of places in the ebook where there's like a paragraph gap and I don't know why there's time skips happening Ooh, and I don't know what fills them. No that is, that comment. is, a, oh, I, there are lots of them. I, I noticed them just before we sat down and I need to go back and like, there's a secret code. Yeah. I'm going to lose my mind. Uh -huh. I'm going to lose my damn mind. Good, good. I like the sound of that. You're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. Next week on the show, we will be doing chapters 6 to 13 of Alex Pavese's The Eighth Detective or Eight Detectives, wherever your edition comes from. I just have to keep saying both because all of my digital notes say The Eighth Detective, but my physical copy is The Eight Detectives, and it's, it's going to drive me insane, Herds. It's going to drive me almost as insane as you are. Look, I'm going to go have a lie down. I need to, like, refresh my brain and have another tackle with these new chapters with more mysteries and more evidence for me to mess with. I mean, listen, it's nearly 9.30 on a Sunday night right now, Herds. You need to oh go have goodness. a lie down. Get your good, I do. good sleep before a hard week's work solving this murder mystery. Oh, it's all I ever do. 
All right, I'm out. <laughs> I'm going to bed. Ugh. This is your Motor Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. We'll catch you next week. See you around. <laughs>